Hello, and welcome to this Analyst Angle on the Cube. I'm Rob Stretche, Managing Director with the Cube Research. Today, we are continuing our conversation about the next intelligent data platform and what it might look like in the future. We are going to be digging into what organizations are seeing as the path forward, the new modern data stack, and how the different components are being utilized. Recently, we did some research with our partner, Enterprise Technology Research, or ETR, where we query 105 joint Databricks and Snowflake customers. Two exciting things from this research really are applicable to today's discussion, and they're the following. First, we asked which modern data platform compute engines are you using? As you can see from this graphic, over a third of organizations that responded are using at least one other platform than Databricks or Snowflake. This is not shocking as many organizations have different divisions or even different use cases and personas, which is why we see so much overlap in this market. The next thing we found very interesting after asking, are you using any on-premise or hybrid cloud data platforms in addition to those cloud-based ones? Unsurprisingly, we found that half of organizations are still leveraging the robust capabilities of Microsoft SQL Server. However, it's equally interesting to note that over a third of the respondents are also utilizing Oracle or MongoDB, showcasing the diverse landscape of the modern data platform. Once again, we see other and Couchbase showing up for organizations with use cases that can't be solved by cloud-based data platforms, such as cruise liners at sea where they're disconnected from the cloud. Now, let me welcome in my companion in data, George Gilbert, Principal Analyst with the Cube Research, to unpack things further. Also, let me welcome in two special guests who are on the cutting edge of the next intelligent data platform, from Voltron Data, we have Josh Patterson, who's the CEO, and we have Rodrigo Arambur, who's the co-founder and field CTO. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you for having us. So let's start off with a question we kind constantly rack our brains against, because as we start to see, we've been talking about the next intelligent data platform and the separation between compute and storage, but what you guys are seeing is actually going even further than that. And you're seeing kind of that next wave where we're starting to actually go through and abstract and break apart even the compute layer. So can you give us your perspective on the stack being more composable versus a fully integrated stack like that of Snowflake or Databricks? That's a great question, Rob. Even, you know, Snowflake and Databricks are starting to adopt these composable standards. Um, Databricks, they were one of the first to say that, you know, Apache Arrow is now the de, now the uh, de facto standard uh, for data, for tabular data representation. And you're also seeing both Snowflake and Databricks adopting open data formats um, and open table formats like Iceberg, uh, Delta, Hootie. And so we're seeing this really interesting movement to open standards. Um, you know, not only are people, you know, using both Snowflake and Databricks, you're actually starting to see people using, you know, Iceberg with both, uh, you know, Snowflake and Databricks and, you know, kind of standardizing a common data lake across both of them. And so the next evolution of that is what does it look like when we start standardizing APIs, uh, instead of having, you know, uh, a different Python data frame library or a different uh, SQL dialect across all these different systems. You have, you know, really great things like SQL Alchemy and SQL Glot, allowing people to write SQL once and then use type of a, uh, IR to uh, generate SQL across different uh, systems, as well as, you know, tools like IBIS uh, that allow people to write a Python, uh, you know, data frame uh, like experience, but then run that uh, across you know, Spark, Databricks, Snowflake, BigQuery, and a myriad of other systems. Um, and so composability is really about freedom, freedom to take your code and run it across a myriad of different engines, but also have your data use different engines as well. 
Yeah, I think that makes total sense because when we we look at this, it is about getting leverage. And I, I think, like you said, we actually spent a lot of time talking about things like parquet and iceberg tables when we were talking about this back in February. I think one of the things that we see is that the proliferation of data products and data apps seems to be driving the need and desire for a more you know, modular data stack. Is that what you guys are seeing? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, Rodrigo, he wrote our composable codex. Um, it's a really great uh, long form series of blog. In fact, Rod, you want to talk about the codex and you know why we were inspired to write it? Yeah, so thanks so much. Basically what we've been saying, and we've been saying this across time, right? Like we're talking the Hadoop era and Spark, um, and even Snowflake, right? This separation of storage and compute was so this really, really big movement. But taking it further from like the API layer, as Josh was mentioning, really allows companies when they have all these vendor products to choose the right tool for the right job. And so one of the ways that we think about this, or we've even heard this, we've been hearing this for years. This is actually what, what incepted the IBIS project, which is a Pythonic data frame for, for targeting multiple different engines, was companies were building out abstraction layers where they would have their own domain-specific language inside the organization to target multiple different engines, whether that was MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, Snowflake, et cetera. And building that abstraction layer out within a company is a pretty daunting and challenging task as well as keeping it up to date and adding new engines. So a project like Ibis really takes that out of the hand of the independent corporate company, right? And puts it in the hand of an open source community that allows everyone to really benefit off of that labor. Yeah, I, I think that to me makes so much sense because I, I think, again, abstract abstractions and getting to APIs, I mean, that's really what made cloud roll was that abstraction layer and being able to be able to API everything. But there's also this, this idea that, you know, accelerated hardware uh, features prominently, especially when you start to look at LLM training and inference transform. What is Voltron really delivering in this area as well? Well, you know, one of the things that everyone focuses on when you think about LLMs is the size and the scale of training needed to really kind of push state of the art. And as we grow the number of parameters, the amount of GPU hours to train these algorithms is becoming immense, which directly correlates to power. We are using a lot of energy to train these really large models. And everywhere you look, data centers are running out of energy. Um, we were on the call with a, a very large uh, system integrator, uh, and the partner had to pause the call because one of the companies, one of their clients, they didn't put in a call option for energy, lost a large amount of energy for a data center, and now they don't know how to power it. Um, you know, the, the bid wars for energy are, are, are very real, especially in the, uh, the Northeast. And so what's really interesting is, um, at the same time, GPUs are these very power hungry things that everyone thinks about and how they're, you know, using a lot more energy for data analytics with Theseus, we're showing that we can do, uh, analytics with a fraction of the power, uh, with our current, uh, architecture using a 100s, you know, we're essentially you know, able to do uh, really large scale data analytics for about 80% less power, a 20th of the power, uh, you know, a fifth the energy. Um, and, you know, we're working on some really amazing things that we're going to be announcing at the end of the quarter on how we could probably push that to 95% power reduction. So 5% of the energy used. And so if it's difficult to use GPUs, even with all of the energy reductions, even with all the speed ups that we had in our benchmarking report, with all of these things, if the barrier of entry is too high, people aren't going to do it. But, you know, with modular, interoperable, composable, extensible systems, um, you know, mice for short, as we like to say, uh, it gets easier. And so if I can just plug in, you know, Theseus without people changing their APIs, without people changing their data format, then they can benefit from all this acceleration. They can get faster performance. They can use fewer servers. They can actually shrink down their data center footprint and they can save energy, or they can transfer that energy that they were using for big data into AI. Yeah, just to piggyback off of what Josh is saying there, 
when people think about GPUs, like he's saying, everyone always thinks about the power budget of the servers are so high. But if you really break it down to what's the actual challenge, what's the problem that's being solved? What is the query and what is the performance? What's the amount of wattage necessary to run that query? We call it performance per watt. That's when you start getting into totally new territory that nothing like what's out there on the market. And so if I need 200 or 1,000 Spark servers to necessarily run a particular benchmark, or I can do that with two GPU servers, the total energy output or footprint is so much lower. The land footprint is so much smaller. The hardware requirements are that much less. It really, it really is just, you know, best of all world. So maybe uh, put all the pieces together for us with, like we've got the composable, you know, data system. It's now not just compute and data. We've gone from separating compute and storage which gave us scalability. Now we have computing data, so you have multiple engines can that can get at the data. Now you're even decomposing the execution engine so you can support multiple APIs. You've got it on um, accelerated hardware, so you have much better price performance and energy performance. Now you put that together in Theseus, that's an OEM, OEMable sort of execution engine. What does that make possible that we couldn't do with today's um, separation of compute and data alone? So what it makes possible is people to start building domain-specific data systems that would otherwise been prohibitively expensive to build. And so when everything is in a, a vertically integrated monolith, um, and I talk a lot about cybersecurity, it's one of the areas that I'm really passionate about. Uh, we're actually about to launch a cybersecurity uh, advisory board um, this week. And it's really difficult to not only build threat detection, build all these different rules engines for different things that could be happening in your network, anomaly detection, user entity, uh, behavior analysis. There's so many things that a cyber uh, security company is doing. Asking them to build a data product on top of that and data management, it's a lot for any one company to do. But now we have really great innovation at the, the data management layer, you have, you know, much faster, uh, storage systems, you know, with your vast data, your WECAs, your DDNs of the world. And then you have these, you know, these data lake companies on top of those as so everyone's starting to specialize. And it's kind of like the industrial revolution as people specialize on individual layers, each one of those layers get better, but you need standards to bring it all together. And so when you have these faster layers from the ground up, better networking, better storage, better data management. Now I can start to do the same thing with this compute engine. Uh, and you're already seeing it with like DuckDB and Mother Duck. You know, Theseus is another example of that, where it's a, it's a query engine that is meant to be, you know, kind of OEM'd by others. And so they can build these domain-specific applications on top of it, where you can, you know, have a much, you know, smaller footprint, faster, less energy. And you can go after business use cases that were otherwise, you know, prohibitively expensive to do. And this is all enabled by, you know, uh, open periphery. Um, I think Rodrigo, you, 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 or maybe Ian internally talked about open periphery at first. And I was like, wow, oh, what is, what is this? But it, it really kind of like stuck with me. And so Rod, you want to talk more about, uh, open periphery? Yeah. So one of the things that we really care about is how is it that you're able to align incentives to be as honest and true to the community that the customers are based on. And so. When we think about our business model, for example, DCS is our hardware accelerated query execution engine, and that is closed source. That is our IP, and it's what we sell either directly to customers or we do this OEM model where we license it out and it's embedded in, for example, a cybersecurity ISP. But the open source stack exists in the periphery. It's how data moves over the network. It's how data is represented in memory. It's how the API communicate to the engine. And by having them entirely outside of our core product, it allows us to have to build out and fund communities out in the market that know exactly what they work on, exactly why they're working on those challenges. And there's never a debate internally of, oh, should this be open source or should this not be open source? If it has anything to do with IBIS, it's an IBIS. If it has anything to do with Arrow, it's an Arrow. If it has anything to do with Flight, which is the network protocol for Arrow, it's inside Arrow or inside Flight. And, and we don't have that debate and it creates a more honest and better incentivized community in our, in, in our perspective. Okay. So, um, 
help help us paint you know a picture of what a world looks like where we we had once upon a time all these specialized products that did their own data management now they can have you know a much greater choice of scalability let's say embeddable on a single node uh let's say whether it's DuckDB, all the way up to huge throughput that a theseus might enable and then all these systems i assume can communicate in the future because we have this common um, memory interchange format like with with Arrow, what might a world like that look like? Well, one great example of this, you know, in cybersecurity is you could start with a company like Tensor. It's a, um, a smaller, younger company um, out of Germany, I believe. And what they do is, you know, real-time ingestion of a, of a myriad of different uh, cybersecurity uh, systems data and telemetry data. They put it into this kind of open standard uh, that the cybersecurity community has. That standard is really around uh, the schema of the data, um, the layout of the data, but they put it in an error format and they have error extensions uh, that are cybersecurity specific. And so they can then dump all that data into a standard data lake. Then they can start to bring in new query engines, whether that is DuckDB, Polars, Data Fusion, Spark, what have you for the analysis, or they could bring in something like Theseus uh, if they wanted to, you know, be able to analyze a much larger amount of data in a much smaller uh, time frame, and then you have, you know, kind of these uh, cross-language APIs like Ibis being able to talk to DuckDB, Polars, Data Fusion, Spark, Theseus, and so now when you, your your cyber defenders are building their systems, they can collect all these logs from their firewall, from their network, from all these endpoint protections. That's getting normalized into arrow and arrow extension types, getting dumped into a standard data lake. They get better indexing, better performance, and they can query things locally, you know, with these local engines, they have distributed engines. And the really cool thing is with things like IBIS, you can even talk to things like Blink and Rising Wave. And so you can even deploy that logic to real time streams as well. And because arrow is the de facto standard uh, for data, it's also adopted by PyTorch, TensorFlow, Hugging Face. And so now you can pull in all these AI extensions to run Onyx models, to run, you know, these LLMs for threat detection, to do, you know, unsupervised learning. And so now the whole system just got a lot more rich because you can pull the best of breed from everything and imagine building a, 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 a modern security stack, a, a SEM. For large companies, they could say, well, I'm just going to build it myself now. I have so much data. I have so many engineers with open standards. I, I'm just going to build my own data lake and build my own, my own you know, security incident and management system. But also, if you're an existing SIM company, you can say, well, if I kind of change my, my core engine, if I change my data to look more like Arrow, I can now start to pull in these AI capabilities a lot easier. I can accelerate my queries so I can lower my cog, so I can make more money. Um, it really just allows everyone to do what their core business value prop is better and delight their end users a lot more, um, faster, cheaper. Um, and, and that's really, you know, what we believe is getting unlocked these composable data systems. Yeah. So and, one let, oh, I still go ahead. Drew. All right. One, one last question for me, which is let's, let's schematically try and lay out how all these standards fit together for those, you know, of us who aren't as close, um, where, you know, there's, there's the, on this sort of layout format with, with Parquet, there's the table format with Iceberg. Where does um, the, where does Arrow and the Arrow database connectivity fit? And then some of those other um, language APIs help sort of take that soup and put it more into a schematic. Yeah. Absolutely. So go for it, Rod. That's, that's exactly what I was actually going to touch on. So financial services industry is an area where, where, where we have a lot of customers and where we support a lot of these use cases. And one of the things that we say in the composable kit, in the composable codec is that over time, any system will naturally gain entropy and become more chaotic. And so we're all about embrace the chaos. And so at those financial services customers, particularly in high frequency trading, they have a myriad of different data sources. Maybe they have some database and data warehouses. You can think Snowflake, you can think Postgres, you can think all those things. They have data lakes that have a bunch of parquet files that are on top of those as well. So Arrow becomes the protocol within which you communicate to all of those different data silos so that you have one singular protocol to be able to talk to them 
you don't have to write, you know, bespoke code to every single different data source as it exists, right? So then what it's able to do is it's able to push that data up in a distributed, federated manner. So you don't have to bottleneck everything down to, you know, one computer that then has to re-federate it back out. So you're able to maintain high performance, high throughput uh, solutions up and up that stack. Then what happens at the top end, you have this API abstraction, right? Where you're able to choose one API that talks to all these different things. And that allows you to be able to make sure that you can choose the different tool or technology that makes sense. And so ODBC, JDBC, for example, is incredibly popular in trying to do this, but it doesn't really do it well at very large data sets because it's row based and the data comes out in material fashion. So Arrow, we created the ADBC, which is very similar to, you know, ODBC or JDBC in terms of a database connector, but everything's coming out in columnar data. And so once you create these standards, and this is what we literally see these high frequency training firms do by utilizing all these different technologies in the stack, they can point to the right engine, to the right problem. So maybe DuckDB is the right engine for a very particular use case, and that's what it's necessarily pointing to. Maybe Presto or Spark makes a ton of sense for what they're doing because of what they have to hand off to at the end of that pipeline. Or maybe Theseus, our hardware accelerator engine, makes sense because nothing can cost performantly really run that query. And so that's how we see it playing out at our customers, and it gives them a ton of value because they can flip on a dime, whether or turn on a dime and choose the engine that makes the most sense for them. They're able to standardize the way that they communicate with all of their data sources. They're able to standardize the way they talk to all of their engine. And when a new engine comes out into the market that makes sense for a particular use case, they can much more seamlessly adopt it and take advantage of that as opposed to being beholden to a vendor that would lock them in through a monolithic stack. So just to add a little bit more to what Rod was saying, you know, you have Parquet at the bottom that all the, you know, the data lakes are using, all the data catalogs, and then, you know, they all have different ways of having, you know, updates and inserts and other types of, you know, metadata management. Um, but when you want to retrieve that data from these different data lakes where they're all standardizing on Parquet, but even, you know, underneath uh, that, you could have other formats like Org or Avro or, or, you know, JSON, what have you. They're using Arrow and ADBC and Flight to pull data in a distributed manner to all these other different query engines. And then you have your query engines. And then those query engines can talk to different APIs, whether that's through Substrate, which is a data analytics intermediate representation layer, or through something like IBIS. And then at your top layer, you have your APIs. And so you really get this, you know, many to many connection at every point of the stack. You have APIs going through Substrate or IBIS to talk to a myriad of different engines. These engines can talk to a myriad of different uh, storage uh, systems whether they're data lakes or databases through uh, ADBC and Arrow Flight. And then underneath that, you have, you know, these other open, uh, you know, data formats at rest for how you can uh, write that data. And so you really have this, you know, composability all the way up and down. And so you can really kind of, um, you know, kind of hardy boys, you know, pick your own destiny uh, and build your best system. Yeah, I would have gone choose your own adventure, but that that's that's just me. That was me. I wasn't a big hardy <laughs> boys fan, but... I, I think I, I think one of the things that I, I, I and you guys kind of just hit on it, and George's question was kind of going to it. When you start to look at and you're going in and introducing this into a financial, you know, an FIS customer or something like that, and they're they're not used to thinking about it in this way because they're you know pro probably very stovepipe in how they've gone and deployed one of the you know five different uh, you know platforms that we talked about earlier how do you go about introducing this to them in in a in a way that hey here's where you start so you can get to that finish line of having a better you know better cross silo experience because the data is still a lot of times siloed even though if they're using iceberg or hootie or what have you to go across those you know from a table format perspective uh, there's still a lot of silos there so this is one of the reasons why we started off our business with enterprise support. Uh, one of the first things that people are saying, hey, what are the open standards? As we start to adopt them, what's the backstop for them? Uh, how do I know if something breaks? There's something going to be there, best when a hot fix it, there's a vulnerability. And so that was the, 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 the genesis of enterprise support at Voltron Data. It was for us to become trusted advisors of the companies, help them you know, build these open 
uh, data systems, these composable data systems. Um, and that naturally paves the way for Theseus. As systems become more composable, as you start to, you know, help people understand like, hey, you know, because of this, here are your silos. And if you adopt this standard here, we can start to bring these three systems closer together. We can, you know, kind of interoperate between all of them. Eventually over time, this can become one system and we can replace these other things. It allows them to, to start seeing the flexibility. The flexibility then allows them to figure out what is their most important thing? What are the things that they actually need accelerated? And what can they continue to send to these legacy systems? And, you know, really this, this open periphery, this composable data system, what it allows people to do is prioritize where they want to, to spend money to improve things without feeling like they have to improve everything. And so, you know, the, the, the composability is not just uh, to, you know, kind of uh, pick the best system for performance. It's also pick the problems you actually want to make better. And for the rest of the stuff, if it's working and there's no more marginal value of, you know, changing it, don't. Um, and I think something that's really interesting in what Josh is saying, I always think about the path to composability is a journey and projects like Apache Arrow, it's already north of 150 million downloads a month, right? So almost 2 billion downloads a year. And it's not reaching that number necessarily because every individual person knows explicitly what Apache Arrow is and they're downloading it themselves. It's because it is so ingrained and embedded in so many different tools and technologies and platforms out there. So when a customer comes to us and asks, how do I get started? Normally the answer is you actually already have started. You're part of the way down this journey or this path. Let's find out where you are so we can plot a course. And so that's something that we find really, really exciting too. Yeah. Yeah. We, and, and again, in that data that we were talking about, we actually see uh, open table formats, although they're not heavily being utilized between Delta and uh, Iceberg, we see that 60%, oh, over 60%, we're looking at that they're going to be going to an open table format at that lowest, you know, I guess it's not the lowest level when you start to talk about disk and storage, but at that next layer up at the beginning of the data platforms. How do you see the future of data analytics and AI infrastructure evolving as you kind of sit at that layer where most people are trying to figure out what's their, you know, ROI or ROAI uh, as it would be on AI and how do they get the value out of it? How do you see, you know, the landscape changing and how do you see yourselves fitting in there? So one of the things that I really just always been amazed uh, at NVIDIA for is thinking on first principles and realizing, you know, what will be the problems of tomorrow way before anyone else realized them. You know, every, you know, NVIDIA knew that energy was going to be a problem, you know, very early on. And you saw, you know, even back in 2016, 2017, they talked about how much energy this is going to save for this application and that application, whether it was video, you know, encoding or, um, you know, data analytics, because to really pave the way for AI, you're going to use a lot more energy. And so if we can save energy in all these other places, we can, you know, repurpose it for these massive AI, you know, models. Um, the other thing was networking. Uh, NVIDIA realized very early that high performance data analytics, big data had the exact same topology footprint as large AI training. And so what's good for AI is actually great for data analytics. We are very dependent on very fast networks. Um, you know, Theseus itself, you know, just really does well when the networking is better. Um, so when you think about things like, you know, Oracle, uh, and OCI, uh, DGX cloud, you have not only the, the NVIDIA GPUs, but you also have a lot of really high speed networking, you know, one-to-one, -one, you know, GPU to NIC ratios. Um, and so you get this East West traffic and, you know, I, I've just been watching a lot of the, uh, different, you know, kind of NVIDIA, uh, presentations, Jensen at, you know, various conferences. And he talks a lot about like networking in this kind of single machine, you know, it's a future at data centers. And they're just really far ahead of everyone else with networking. And I think that's, you know, one of the convergence that we're going to see as we start to, you know, improve data analytics by these orders of magnitude with things like Theseus, we want to realize that networking becomes a lot more important and, you know, we're going to start seeing higher and faster storage. And we're already seeing that from, you know, vast data, WECA, DDN, as I said earlier, where it's denser storage, it's faster storage. It has more 
uh, throughput, you know, than ever. And so it's actually shrinking down a lot of these big data problems into smaller footprints, but they're much more interconnected with better storage and better networking, which is going to pave the way for both AI as well as data analytics. And so I actually see a convergence of AI uh, and big data. Yeah, I, I think that makes total sense. And I, I think, again, you one kind of builds upon the other as well. So it's not like either or. And I, I think that's where people get wrapped around the axle. It's like, oh, no, that's my data lake for doing analytics and, you know, my recommendations engine, which is, you know, maybe even based on ML. But, you know, you start to look at how they bring things like Gen AI forward. You want that corpus of data to be at the fingertips. What, what are you guys seeing from, you know, again, the ecosystem? Because I, I know when we've talked before, you've been talking to some OEMs. Uh, some of them have mentioned you to us uh, as well, uh, that they're working with you in the background. So, you know, we're, we're hearing good things. So how has that been going And when you're, you're looking at these intergalactically large OEMs and what you're doing is so new to especially and potentially disruptive to some of the things that they're doing already? So part of this is, you know, Rodrigo's uh, strategy. So Rod, I'm gonna let you take this one. I mean, the way that we basically see it and where where Josh and I got really, really excited about this in the early days is in the fullness of time, every industry will specialize, right? And when I think about the database ecosystem or data analytics ecosystem, right? We're talking 60 years or so. And that's really not that much time for the industry to demonstrate all that specialization if you compare it to other ones that might be finance thousands of years old. And so we really focus a lot of our IP and where we really drive our R&D efforts is in being this engine. The engine itself is not something that we necessarily need to put together and sell directly to all of our customers. We can put it in the hands of other vendors out there that necessarily need, the way I like to think about it is, have you effectively been bamboozled into becoming a database company without ever meeting to be a database company, right? And so Josh brings up cybersecurity as an incredible example of that, where your secret sauce, your domain expertise has nothing necessarily to do with data analytics and it's all what does the data analytics enable you to do? But at the end of the day, if you look at their engineering teams, if you look at their cog, where all the money is being spent, it's all entirely on building out these incredibly complex data platforms to be able to serve it, that domain expertise. We see the same thing in OLTP databases, right? Where they're incredible at transactional processing and managing data. But then if you want to enable analytical use cases on top of that OLTP database, it can be pretty challenging, right? And it can cost a lot of money to make that happen. And so these are the kind of partners out there that we're looking to leverage our engine inside their stack so that they don't have to build an OLAP query engine from the ground up for themselves. They can leverage our IP. We can embed it because of all of these amazing composable open source integration standards, right? And it's off to the races, so much faster, so much less money, and all the other benefits that these kids bring that Josh has already talked about, you know, energy, space. Yeah, totally. And I think, again, that, that makes so much sense. George, you look like you got a question there. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm following this and I'm like, this is, it just goes so far beyond that, that sixth data platform that we started to talk about, I think last summer, which is the, the modularization, um, where you're taking it so much further than, than, you know, we were even imagining and, um, and where now the ecosystem of, of any product that has to process or analyze data can now have a state-of-the-art engines and and more than that, interoperability with other systems. That's, you know, beyond what we really understood when we first started trying to wrap our heads around this. Yeah. No, it's it's definitely been that way. And I, I, I want to thank you guys for coming on board. You know, this has been really great. I know it's taken us a little time to get this all straightened out in all our schedules uh, from all of us being all over the place. But, uh, you know, being busy is a good thing. Uh, that That's that's putting it mildly. So, you know, thank you both for coming on board. And, uh, you know, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Rob, George, thank you for having us. Thank, thank you very much.
And thank you for watching this Analyst Angle on The Cube, the leader in analysis and news. Stay tuned for more, especially on that next-gen data platform. We'll be bringing you more. Stay tuned.